first, thank you very much for being here, for inviting me to uh, present a current research project um, on uh, cybersecurity, a new issue, um, a new type of uh, attack in cybersecurity. Uh, it's, I'm a research fellow at the moment uh, with the cybersecurity project in the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard Kennedy School. So the first thing to say is that this is a policy school. And because it's a policy school, the cybersecurity research we do, although it's technically informed, is directed at policymakers. So it's designed to solve and address issues that policymakers care about. Um, and so I talk just as much with people uh, working in public policy, in global policy, as I do with uh, technical specialists. So the research center I'm in goes between the two. This research is for aimed at uh, policymakers. And it identifies a change in uh, adversary tactics uh, that we've seen over the last few years um, towards what I call hack and leak operations. What I'll do is I'll first define these theoretically because it's a new concept. I'll say exactly what I mean by a hack and leak operation, what sort of incidents would be considered within that frame, and what is often associated with leaking and hacking, but I want to exclude it as well. So I'll start with a theoretical definition. I'll then go into some instances of hack and leak operations globally uh, to see exactly how these things play out, what effect they have um, on states and societies. And then I'll look at a couple of examples from the region as well. Um, finally, I'll try and draw some conclusions about hack and leak operations, about how to understand their aims, their effects, and then maybe how to mitigate them as well. So, first of all, hack and leak are common terms. They're quite vague. We see them regularly in uh, the media. And so I want to be a little bit more precise. By hack, I mean an unauthorized intrusion into computer networks. As cybersecurity specialists, this will be extremely familiar to all of you. Our day-to-day -day job is preventing, identifying, these types of intrusions. Um, so I don't need to say too much more about that. Um, what's worth saying is that classically for uh, cybersecurity threats, there are many levels of intrusion. And the ones that are considered most sophisticated, that are considered most concerning or most risky are advanced persistent threats. Sophisticated state-sponsored or state-associated threats against an organization or government. So although there is a range of hacks, the ones that are most sophisticated, most concerning, are those sponsored by states, APTs. And I'll talk about those state actors uh, in this presentation. And these go back quite a long way. Stuxnet and um, is a classic example of um, a state-sponsored uh, hack. Leaks, on the other hand, are defined as a non-standard release of information into the public domain. Um, non-standard because there are processes for releasing information that is secret in every organization. Uh, moving from the private to the public is very important uh, in disclosure of information. But leak is where this release happens outside of normal practices. Um, it's done without permission. Is done in an unauthorized manner. And in at least American politics, there is a lot, there are a lot of examples of such leaks. Going back to the Pentagon Papers, where they were photocopied individually um, and then passed to a newspaper uh, 30 years ago. The Snowden disclosures in 2013 are another example of a leak, 
uh, again, in this case, copied, downloaded um, through access to a whole range of systems in the American intelligence um, agencies. So leaks are a big issue. Hacks are a big issue. Occasionally, we see them both at the same time. And we see one actor, we see a, a, the same actor hack into a network, intrude an intrusion into a computer network, taking that information and then leaking it into the public domain. That's what I call a hack and leak operation. The aim of this project is to understand these operations, understand why they happen and what effect they have. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I just want to now carry on the theoretical part with a couple of related concepts that I want to be clear about what I'm not talking about. So, because most leaks of information now involve internet technologies, such as the Snowden disclosures, they, of, they often get the name of a cybersecurity issue or a hacked leak. I'm not going to talk about any leaks that do not also involve an unauthorized intrusion into computer networks in order to obtain the information. There's a large range of other leaks that are cyber or hacked that I'm not going to talk about here. I'm also not going to use the term data breach, even though data breach is a very common concept for cybersecurity specialists such as yourself. And that's because data breaches are much wider than hack and leak operations. Not all data breaches involve leaking the information into the public domain. So, for example, in a company, you might have uh, a data breach where cyber criminals obtain credit card information. They take that credit card information and then sell it. That's not a leak into the public domain. No one, you or I, are unable to access that information uh, as it stands. So there are data breaches where information is exfiltrated, it's taken, but it's not released publicly. And that's why data breaches are a much broader concept than that of hack and leak operations. Finally, I'm going to talk only about hack and leak operations that are politically motivated. This is partly because, the, as I said earlier, the most concerning actors, the APTs in cybersecurity, are those who are, have political motivations. They are state-sponsored. They're not doing it for financial gain. They're doing it uh, for political motivations. Um, although you might see some hack and leak operations that are not politically motivated, such as providing a sample of uh, personal data information to demonstrate that a cyber criminal has got access to authentic data, this is not the most concerning aspect of hack and leak operations. So I will talk only about politically motivated hack and leaks, not maybe financially motivated ones. And that's a big question mark in the middle of the screen there. So a quick global view. Um, there have been some politically motivated hack and leak operations uh, worldwide in the last seven or eight years. Although the number is quite small, we're talking below 50, um, 35 confirmed, some others not confirmed. Um, this is a very small number of cybersecurity incidents worldwide and even APT incidents. So if you compare to databases publicly available, such as that by the Council on Foreign Relations uh, in New York, they publish a data set of APTs in cybersecurity. And they have tracked around two or 300 APTs, different APT incidents and different APT groups. So we're already seeing that at most 10% of those groups, of those incidents, are involving leaking. The rest of them may be sabotage or espionage, taking the data but not putting it into the public domain. So um, the number, the total number is not big, but I'm interested in the effect rather than the quantity. 
the other thing you can see from this uh, graph is that initially hack and leak operations were not APT links. They were not performed by state actors. Instead, one particular group, Anonymous, which is a political uh, collective, um, very active uh, in cyberspace. Uh, it's been members have been uh, identified in Europe, in the US, um, in South America, in all over the world. And this collective um, attempted to hack and leak information from a range of organizations in line with its political aims. So to make a political statement. Um, following US federal action against this group, so uh, key individuals in Anonymous were um, arrested and charged uh, in 2013 and 2014. This group seized a lot of its activity. Um, but what you see then instead, as the graph shows, is that other actors begin to conduct hack and leak operations instead of anonymous. And I'll look at those other actors in this presentation. Finally, you can see that both public and private sectors are equally at risk from these operations. Um, the blue is governments, the orange is companies. And it's roughly a 50-50 split about whether targets are in the public or the private sector. So, from a global overview, I'm now going to look at a few specific incidents of hack and leak operations in the US and in Europe. Um, to start with, uh, well, and also one instance in Africa, because the picture to the top left um, is the election in 2015 of Mohamed Bahari. Um, in Nigeria. In this election, one company called Cambridge Analytica was hired to promote Bahari's opposition in this election. Um, their parent company, Cambridge Analytica, were owned by a public relations company called SCL, had done exactly the same in 2007. They'd been hired to um, perform public relations to put forward the campaign for one candidate in this election. The distinction between their earlier work from 2007 and in 2015 is that in 2015, Cambridge Analytica received information obtained by computer hackers um, from uh, hackers that had got access to the Nigerian government of information that they wanted to release and use in their propaganda campaign. So this was a, a very early instance of a politically motivated uh, hack and leak operation. And of course, you have probably heard of Cambridge Analytica. Um, it featured much more heavily later on in both the US presidential election in 2016 and then the UK Brexit referendum. Um, and in, yeah, <laughs> enough said about that. So now I want to delve a little bit more deeply into the key case for hack and leak operations and the one that really concerns the US policymakers that I talk to regularly um, over in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is the release of emails and documents from the Democratic National Committee during the 2016 presidential election in the US. Um, these documents were, again, obtained by an intrusion into the networks of the Democratic National Committee, the DNC. Um, and that initial intrusion was um, very much targeted at key figures. John Podesta was the chairman of this committee, and he was subject to a sustained spear phishing campaign. Um, this campaign was eventually successful, not because he didn't realize that he was being spear or that he hadn't been 
properly prepared? He had. He'd forwarded the email that he was concerned about to his IT security team. The IT security team, unfortunately, according to their own account later on, looked at the email, sent it back to him, and said, this is not a security threat. Of course, what they said later on was that they meant to say, this is a security threat, do not click on the link. Instead, they accidentally put the word not in. Um, so even though employee awareness, senior figure awareness was very high for the DNC, they were still unable to prevent access to their network through phishing, which is a um, classic example of the uh, inability of organizations to reduce their phishing risk to zero, and the reason that even sophisticated actors still rely on phishing as a reliable means of compromise. The emails themselves were then released on WikiLeaks. And WikiLeaks is a really important part of this story because Julian Assange, the founder and um, leader of WikiLeaks, uh, was not a part of the group that actually hacked into the networks. Um, and the group were later identified as a specific Russian uh, state-linked group. Julian Assange and WikiLeaks had their own motivations. They had a very different idea about um, what should be public information, about their role in publishing this information, not to influence the elections in a particular way, but to uh, make sure that the US government was as open as possible about information. So their, mo their motivations, their identity was very different to that of the hackers themselves. And they're an intermediary in this hack and leak operation, an intermediary that was uh, very important in actually making it successful, putting it into the public domain, because firstly, they were able to talk directly to the hackers themselves through um, a specific Twitter account. So Assange spoke directly to the hackers who had access to inf this information, and then by talking to the media in general. So WikiLeaks would push out these email releases to both mainstream media and also the media that um, was campaigning for on the Trump side. So these intermediaries are really important in hack and leak operations. And I'll talk a little bit more about how they work less well in the French connection. The final thing that's worth saying about the DNC example is that forensic analysis of the intrusion is very complex. After the fact, after these emails have been released, um, the DNC hired several uh, large cybersecurity companies, well-known ones in the US, to do a forensic analysis um, of the compromise. What these groups found is that actually there hadn't only been one compromise. There'd been several, and there'd been several by different Russia-linked state actors into the same networks. What was interesting was that at least two groups had been active, one for a couple of years. So they'd had access to these networks for a sustained period of time, but they hadn't done anything. So again, they had behaved like a classic APT. They got in, they'd exfiltrated some data, but just had a foothold in these networks. The other group, the one that was linked to Twitter and WikiLeaks, had got in, taken the data, and leaked it. So even within one state, Russia, even within one campaign, one target, uh, the US elections, we're not seeing hack and leak operations being performed by everyone. So they have to have specific motivations for groups to perform hack and leak operations as opposed to more classic APT behavior. And finally, I said the last point was finally, but this is finally for the US point, is that we don't, still don't know what the effect was. Um, overall, it was clear that there was a lot of media impact from these leaks. It was clear that they were used both to damage the Hillary Clinton campaign and also to distract from uh, negative stories about the Trump campaign. So they were used very tactically 
in this presidential election. But whether these leaks shifted the minds of voters, changed the course of the election, is a really difficult question to answer. And in the context of much broader issues around uh, the targeting of adverts, political advertisement, news, access to Facebook, and so on, it's very difficult to say whether this specific operation had the impact that some claim it did, that it did influence the course of the US election. I'll now move on to a contrasting case. Uh, in France in 2017, the campaign for Emmanuel Macron uh, en marche was again targeted by a hack and leak operation. Um, their networks were compromised, data was taken, and then it was released into the public domain. Um, again, after the fact, this was attributed to a Russia state linked group. But there were very, some significant differences in this case. One was that the hack occurred much later on in the election timeline, only two days before the election itself. So there was not time for the media and for the population to be influenced in the same way as in the US. Added to this, the French media were much more aligned in one particular um, understanding than the partisan US media. So whereas the US media were very much divided between the candidates, the French media together decided and obeyed a government ruling that they should not publish stories based on this data before the election. A very different political context from, the French, from France and the US. The third aspect, which is possibly the most interesting, is that um, the Macron campaign responded in a very different way to the DNC. They were much more aggressive in their response. And there's a couple of examples of this. One is that, again, the campaign, the intrusion used phishing. Um, it used sites which uh, would uh, capture the credentials of various members of the campaign. The Macron's uh, cybersecurity team identified these sites, went on them specifically to enter a lot of false login information, to confuse the attackers, to try and slow them down. So they would have to work out what uh, credentials they could use and what credentials they couldn't use. They also um, used a similar technique called tab napping, where once you uh, follow a link in an email, the, the, um, a third party script between the email and the link takes you back to your email having signed it out. It's then a phishing page and you enter your credentials on that phishing page rather than the email. But in the same, what you see as the same tab as the tab you originally entered. Um, so they tried to confuse the attackers. The second aspect was that they claimed that a lot of the data that had been released was in fact faked, that had been edited um, by the intruders rather than being, being genuine. And that made even WikiLeaks, who again sought to publish the data, hesitate in saying this is real information. So WikiLeaks themselves around the French campaign published a statement saying, we don't know where this has come from. We're not uh, verifying its authenticity completely the opposite response to the one they had in the US. Um, and actually, again, data investigation showed that some of these documents had been edited, um, and also that they'd been edited by a specific person with a Russian name that could be traced back to a Russian intelligence agency. So this release of information gets into a very complex um, question of reliability, but how far hack and leak operations really do leak information taken from organizations, or how far they can be um, used to create false information that is claimed to be leaked. The last example on this slide, um, on the bottom left, is around German politicians. And 
is just to remind everyone that actually the the attribution of the US campaign and the French campaign to Russia created a lot of expectation around this German hack and leak operation um, that was not accurate. So in Germany, in late 2018, the data, personal data of thousands of politicians and celebrities was leaked online. The first response of um, media and of cybersecurity experts was to attribute this to Russia, to say, just as in the US case, just as in the France case, we now see the same actor, the same APT, doing this again in Germany. That turned out to be false. It turned out to be an individual based in Germany who'd got annoyed with the political discourse in Germany. And he had access, he had sufficient skills himself to, again, conduct some phishing attacks, obtain social media credentials of these politicians, and then access their personal data. So although we see a general trend of APT actors, of sophisticated state-linked actors using hack and leak operations, it's not always the case. And we should be wary of attributing uh, in advance or without real evidence. So these are all examples of hack and leak operations globally from the US and Europe. And I'll cover a couple of examples in the region itself. And these examples are centered around the Gulf crisis in 2017. I want to be very clear that I'm not commenting on the crisis itself. Rather, especially from a US point of view, there are several hack and leak operations that occurred with US actors in the US relating to this crisis. I want to explore why we think they have happened and what effect they had. So just to be, um, as a quick run up, there have been not only politically motivated hack and leak operations, but also commercial ones as well in the region. And InvestBank in the UAE and Qatar National Bank in Qatar um, are examples of financial information being obtained through an intrusion and then linked and then leaked uh, publicly. But again, so it's not just government or political figures. However, what we see are hack and leak operations occurring um, on both sides of the crisis um, and generally with figures in the US. So Yusuf al Ataba, UAE ambassador to the UAE, UAE ambassador to the USA. Um, Farhad Azima as another US-based um, businessman. And Elliot Brody is a US-based lobbyist in the Trump campaign. All of these individuals had their personal and business information obtained um, through an intrusion, and then it was leaked online. So it wasn't all leaked online in the WikiLeaks way, but it was leaked through specific media sites. So document uh, collections uh, were given to media organizations to then later release. Um, in all cases, this has now become caught up in the US legal system. So uh, Brody and Asma have both filed lawsuits in the US against Qatar and the UAE respectively, talking about responsibility for hack and leak operations. Um, so this is a domestic political issue in the US, but involving, again, um, the Gulf crisis more broadly. So stepping back slightly, I now want to talk a little bit about um, what we can learn from this, what we can learn from examples of hack and leak operations happening globally and related to the region, and maybe how we can work out best how to mitigate them. I'm actually going to pass this slide and go straight to the concluding one. Um, so hack and leak operations, I try and see them as mechanisms of delegitimization. So by releasing information about a particular organization or party, you're trying to undermine their public credibility. That's why hack and leak operations don't only include a hack, but also a public leak. So it's 
delegitimizing is the aim of these operations. But their impact depends on three areas. First, on the audience. Um, and there are many levels of audiences, domestic, regional, and international. In the WikiLeaks example, in uh, the US elections, we can see that the audience was primarily domestic. It was the voters themselves. In other cases, um, for example, with the US lobbyists around the Gulf crisis, the audience is different. It's an international audience. So that really depend, that really matters to the impact of these operations. The second is the technical characteristics of the operations themselves. <clears throat> what, co what data they steal, whether this data has been edited, whether it is easily accessible and searchable by media organizations, by members of the public, and the way in which these adversaries enter the organization and stay within the organization, obtain um, a persistent presence in the networks themselves. So we can try and understand the impact of hacking operations based on their technical characteristics. And we can link them using these characteristics as well. Um, so instant response has identified, for example, in the US and French case, the same phishing domains being set up um, for both cases, strengthening the connection to the same actor. And finally, it's the context itself. Um, in the Nigerian case, in the US and the French case, and, and the German case, these, all, um, these were very different contexts in which the information uh, was leaked and the operation occurred. From France to the US, on one case you have partisan, you have competitive um, and quite um, vitriolic debate. On the other hand, you have an agreement between citizens and the media to, public some, to not publish information. So, the audience, the characters, and the context all matter for understanding hack and leak operations. And maybe to mitigate these operations, I want to say that we need to be wary of unintentionally assisting the adversary. Uh, we have to not do their work for them. Um, so by uh, maybe clamping down on the types of debate you have, or by uh, strict denials, strong denials of the, inf of the information that is leaked, you can actually help the adversary in achieving their own aim. You need to be wary of doing that. Uh, I'm going to stop there, and I thank you very much for your attention and for the invitation to talk here, and I really look forward to discussion and questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think you're right that um, the question of uh, cyber warfare and uh, military uh, information. 
yeah, it, it's, re it's really important. Um, so far, I mean, the Russian group that is uh, attributed to the, for the French in the US case, what is the military intelligence agency? So they are clearly part of the military. But in terms of targeting military information, which I think is what your question was about, sort of secrets about submarines and uh, Department of Defense uh, data, uh, that should be part of the model. I haven't seen that being as much uh, used in terms of leaking that data as opposed to just taking it and using the data itself. So for, for example, with Chinese espionage in the US, you have a long history of uh, compromising the military and defense contractors, taking the data, information property, but then uh, using it to build replicas or for their own gain. They're not leaking that data publicly. They're not taking the 